Thank you, Santiago, for the introduction. And while my main area of interest is human metabolism, this is a topic that caught my attention in the last year. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity of sharing these ideas. Um, first of all, uh, well, I will talk briefly. This is the outline of, of my talk, uh, evidence about statistical Ill illiteracy among clinicians, an example, a few examples of the ethical problems it generates and the current research we are carrying out at Mexico City. Um, we, all, we already know that evidence-based medicine has its own problems, and I am sure you are not new to them. We already know that almost half of clinical practice guidelines fail to meet the Institute of Medicine standards. We already know that false discovery rate causes a large proportion of published papers to be actually more likely to be wrong than not. And of course, we are already aware of the reproducibility crisis that impacts almost every field in science. However, um, oh, and I, I forgot about this one. Uh, we, we, we know that even if there isn't a reproducibility science, sorry, crisis, even if we give the same database of an already published randomized clinical control trial to a different set of researchers, 35% of published conclusions will change highlighting the importance of independent, of independent uh, data analysis. But let's imagine, let's imagine for, for a moment that all these problems in science and evidence-based medicine don't exist anymore. Uh, let's imagine they are solved. We still have one problem and let me start with a, it's almost a truism, but we can't practice evidence-based medicine if we don't understand the evidence. And as I will show you in a few minutes, evidence suggests we don't. We don't understand the evidence. This is not new. Uh, it has been known for decades and a lot has been written about it, although it hasn't received the enough highlight I think it deserves. Um, we know that when doctors meet numbers, uh, a large proportion of them find them difficult to deal with. We know that regardless of their academic uh, status, regardless if they are medical students or physicians, they struggle understanding probability. We know that in general, doctors uh, struggle understanding statistics. And a lot has been, well, no, I, I can't say it's a lot, but more has been explored or published about this in the last decade. Um, Cancer screening statistics are particularly difficult for, for clinicians. Uh, Bayesian analysis is particularly difficult for clinicians. And let, let me say, uh, let, let me stop a little bit uh, self-bashing my, my colleagues. This is not a clinician-specific phenomenon. Humans struggle dealing, struggle with probabilities and with statistics and with numbers. We know uh, we know we can be fooled by randomness. We know uh, there is a mathematical version of illiteracy, uh, John Allen Paulos named enumeracy. And we know that numbers are not always intuitive for us as a species. However, there are certain things in the medical field and of course, certain consequences that highlight or magnify the importance or relevance of these problems in the medical community, because of course the type of work we do. Um, I would say that the most important research study that has been carried out till this day was carried out at La Charité in Berlin. Uh, Gerrit Gigerenser's group uh, is perhaps uh, the most prolific research group in this in this area, at least for the last 10 years. And what these guys did was that they tested their medical professors and their last year medical students with a quick test. They, they, it's called their quick risk test about their general understanding of basic, these are only basic statistical concepts. They found that depending on the questions, Senior educators did better than students, but not in all of them. 
And the most important finding was that if they paid attention to this problem for three hours a week for two weeks, they dramatically improved the results. If you, if you see the plot, the graph on the right, and compare pre-test scores versus post-test scores, in all groups, sorry, in all questions, there is, there is a very large improvement. However, I think there is room for improvement. This is just a sample uh, of the risk quick test, quick risk test. Um, I think there, there is room for improvement in the way these questions were asked, because for example, some of them, some concepts were evaluated very similarly to how they appear in a textbook. And this is, this is certainly not the norm when we are facing patients. And on the other hand, participants never had the opportunity of admitting they don't know. In other words, they were capable of simply guessing and perhaps getting some right answers uh, just by their ability or, or of, of answering tests or ruling out uh, questions without truly knowing what they were being asked. So I think these two, not exactly problems, but limitations of this test uh, deserve further research. Let me give you an example of how understanding of basic, uh, basic statistical concepts can yield or produce ethical problems. This is a very common statement in preventive care medicine. And being in Cochrane, I'm sure you are perhaps already aware of where I am going with this. Um, breast cancer screening has been claimed to, or is typically claimed to have a 20% reduction in mortality associated to breast cancer. Therefore, the typical conclusion is, okay, we should do lots of breast cancer screening because we will reduce mortality or, well, breast cancer mortality by uh, 20%. However, oh, and let me, let me just give you an example of what our participants, the study I will tell you about later, answered when, when facing the same question. Uh, we didn't say this was breast cancer screening, we simply stated Okay, if an intervention reduces mortality by 20%, how many people are saved? And of course, most people, this is what was expected, most people get this wrong, and we will, we will see why. But what's, what's going on here? And perhaps this is an example, again, being in Cochrane, you already know. Uh, the problem here is that if we analyze absolute numbers, if we analyze the change in the, in the frequency of this related to breast cancer. What we will find was that there is five every thousand breast cancer deaths without screening and four every thousand breast cancer deaths with screening. Since one is a 20% of five, well, yes, you can say there, there has been a 20% mortality reduction. However, this is not how we perceive these numbers, uh, I mean, the way we express these results certainly changes the way we perceive them. And we know, of course, from Cochrane's systematic review on breast cancer screening that the number necessary to treat for breast, the number necessary to screen, sorry, for saving one woman is around 2,000. This, this discrepancy in the way we report risks and results has actually been measured and there is already evidence about it. These authors followed for five years, randomized clinical trials published in three of the most important medical journals. And what they found was that in almost half of them, they don't report the absolute uh, changes in frequency for different outcomes. And they actually found that in 30% of them, there is a difference between uh, one strategy for presenting results, depending on if the result is positive or negative, 
For example, if there is a benefit, it's more likely to report it in relative risk or in a percentage. And if it's a harm, it's more likely to be presented as absolute numbers of frequency. If, if, if there is a benefit, it's more likely that I will say 20% reduction in mortality. If there is harm, it's more likely that I will say one every thousand, one every 2000, et cetera. So this is not necessarily a medical journal trying to deceive clinicians. What's going on is that, of course, everyone wants to make look the results as more impactful or as better looking or more appealing to readers. And since both ways of expressing results are, well, mathematically valid, we choose one over the other depending on the message we are trying to convey. However, and let's go for the ethical problems, this way of reporting data yields. Let's say we have a 40-year-old woman with a positive, aka abnormal, mammogram. Actually, if we look at the numbers, if it's almost 10 times more likely to be a false positive than a true positive. And the way we express results in this field and the way we understand and confuse statistical concepts explains why there is lots of overdiagnosis in breast cancer and of course exposes women to the adverse effects breast biopsies and sometimes surgery have. And let me explain a bit further. Okay, we know, we have measured and published that for this same age group, 40 to 49 years old, the sensitivity of a mammogram falls around 75%, 74, 76%. We also know that the specificity of this, of this screening method is around 90% for the same age group. Well, I won't bore you uh, for long with these tables. I'm sure almost everyone hates. But let's just remember that sensitivity is the percentage of ill people who test positive in a given test, and specificity is the percentage of healthy people who test negative in the same test. In other words, my relationship between true positives and true negatives. What's going on here? Let's go at, at the numbers. The crucial point of data we are missing in our 49-year-old patient is prevalence. Prevalence for breast cancer in this age group is 1.4%. Let's say we send a million women to breast cancer screening with mammograms. Having this prevalence means that of that million women, 14,000 of them have cancer, the 1.4% of 1 million. Since our screening test has a sensitivity of about around 75%. Of these 4,000 women, 10,500 women will test positive. However, let's remember that most of these women do not have cancer. And since the specificity of the test is 90%, this means we are getting a 10% false positive results. 10% of this number is almost 100,000 women. Therefore, if you compare the two numbers, we actually have almost 10 times more false positive tests than true positive tests. And because this is not always intuitive or evident for clinicians, we send lots and lots of women for breast biopsies or sometimes breast surgery Let's also remember that the agreement between pathologists when analyzing breast biopsies is only 25%. Um, this, of course, is the perfect path for an overdiagnosis pandemic. And this comes partly from the confusion the way we expressed or the way the benefits of breast cancer screening were published, but also from a very typical cognitive bias and very typical confusion between sensitivity and positive predictive value. 
this is so common that when we ask, uh, if we ask gynecology residents and their attendings, only 26% of them get it right. It's it, only 26% of them can effectively differentiate between sensitivity and uh, positive predictive value. And let me, uh, perhaps this is also a truism, but it's, I think it's worth mentioning. Um, when we have a positive test result, we don't know if this is a true positive or a false positive. This is what we read in most clinical or biomedical papers, but it's not the question we face in the clinic. The question we face in the clinic is, of course, is this patient ill or not? So sensitivity is helping us very little for answering the question we typically face and our brains virtually are uncomfortable around missing data. We, we, we don't feel we don't feel comfortable when we, when we uh, well, one of my teachers used to say that our brain prefers to invent or create missing data rather than accepting there is missing data. Um, this is of course very different. So if I remember, or, or it's not only because I remember, it's because when I read this paper or when people wrote papers about screening tests or any kind of diagnostic test, we tend to emphasize sensitivity and not necessarily positive predictive value. These papers don't typically mention the importance prevalence has for the most common purpose of their tests. And of course, not surprisingly, the lifetime risk of a woman of being wrongly diagnosed with cancer uh, ranges between 10 and 20%. So of course, I mean, this is, this is intuitive or almost obvious once you, you, you have the context for it. But there is another golden rule. Uh, so there is another ethical problem, perhaps, well, or in my opinion, the, 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 that breaks the most important ethical rule that comes from, I wouldn't say statistical illiteracy, but risk ignorance. Ignorance can sometimes be innocent, can, can be no one's fault. And let me, let me tell you what, what I mean by this. The golden rule is, of course, treat others the way you would be treated. And we have evidence suggesting clinicians don't treat their patients the way they would like to be treated. Uh, we know that oncologists uh, have way lower acceptance rates as acceptance rates for chemo for let's say non-small uh, cell lung. We know that these clinicians and their nurses also have very different views from their patients regarding uh, chemotherapy, if they would accept chemotherapy or surgery or radiotherapy. Doctors or clinicians in general would reject many of the interventions they prescribe for patients in, in, their, in their last years or in their last days. Um, most of them, let, let's, let's, let's compare in this graph, for example, the percentage of them who would accept or would want pain medicine in taking treatments. Of course, no one has to live or to die with pain, but how almost 40%, even a bit more than that, would reject antibiotics or IV fluids as life-sustaining treatments. So, of course, if you go to a hospital, uh, particularly in a pandemic, almost everyone is under IV fluids and antibiotics, regardless of their survival prognosis. So we can definitely say it's not, it's, it's not rare to find clinicians who treat their patients different from the way they would like to be treated. But wh wh why this happens? Wh why it's not, that, it's not that clinicians, it's not that we are bad people who want to hurt patients. It's, it's typically the opposite, fortunately. More than that, 
clinicians change the way they practice after becoming patients. Uh, oncologists who have suffered cancer acknowledge they change the way they practice after experiencing uh, what, what chemo or what surgery or what radiotherapy means. And this is the missing information. This is the risk ignorance I was referring to. Um, the piece we are missing is that we choose differently when we know better, when we have more data about a particular subject. What's the difference between oncologists and their patients? What's the difference between cancer or oncology nurses and their patients? Well, oncology nurses and their patients, sorry, oncology nurses and, and oncologists see more cancer patients, are, are more exposed to the adverse effects, to the suffering these treatments sometimes induce. So they have more information. And this information, this missing information is very, very infrequent in, pub, in medical literature. The very few examples about it, we know, for example, that the majority of patients regret starting dialysis, particularly in their end of life care. Um, this is of course huge. When, when we ask someone to sign an informed consent, for dialysis, very rarely we mention, oh, and by the way, the majority of people who accept what you are about to accept regret it if you ask them later. This piece of information, this regret rate, this data that is subjective because we haven't measured it, but oncologists, cancer nurses, oncology nurses, sorry, and healthcare providers in general do have, because of their experience, is not measured, they're not published, and it's difficult to share with patients. So this is not exactly clinicians misunderstanding statistical concepts. Is clinicians not having the right statistical data to provide ethically informed data to their patients before, before they're, they're asking for their consent. And finally, let me, oh, oh, let, let me say that these ideas are a bit further developed in a paper I wrote, which hopefully will be available online by the end of this month. So uh, um, if you allow me, I would like to share that with you once it's online. And this is what we know. This is what we, this is the evidence we have about statistical, yes, illiteracy, risk ignorance, not necessarily because it's someone's fault. It's just because we haven't done enough research about it. And the ethical problems that come when we don't have these essential information and we don't understand some basic concepts. But let me tell you about what we, about the study we're carrying out in the hospital I work in. This is the National Institute for Medical Sciences and Nutrition in Mexico City. And as most hospitals in Mexico City is now, of course, mostly dedicated to uh, the healthcare of COVID patients. But what we are trying to do is an, well, almost fully online intervention and survey. Uh, Excuse me for not, for not uh, translating this, this slide, but what we did was that, first of all, we carried out a survey on health providers in Mexico in different points of their, of their uh, academic life. And we have all sorts, all sorts of, of participants, ranging from medical students to, to researchers, to, to clinical researchers. We have almost, actually, and this number is actually not updated, we have almost 400 answers, uh, again, ranging from med students to, to attendings. Most people already graduated. Uh, these 26% and these 36% are, these are general practitioners, these are medical specialists. So most people graduated and 
that are very, very interesting answers. We ask them, for example, how many scientific papers they read per week. And they ranged from zero to more than 20. But when we ask them, how many scientific papers do you read per week, including the methods, the methods section? Well, numbers vary greatly. And actually, the question was more about percentage. What percentage of those papers you actually read, including the methods section? And it ranges, of course, from zero to 100. But certainly, most people answer that it's only 5% of those papers or less. From zero to 100, how confident do you feel about your own understanding of the papers you read? And well, most people say they understand the majority of what they are reading. However, well, actually the mean was around 50%. Certainly they are admitting they don't understand them fully. And the baseline results uh, are, because I, I didn't explain that, what we are planning to do is, okay, this is our, this is our baseline. We, we carried out a test very similar to what they did in La Charité, analyzing or sorry, evaluating the same concepts, but allowing people to say, I don't know, and testing these concepts with clinical cases with clinical uh, scenarios, not necessarily with textbook definition questions. They, this test consists in 12 questions. We so far uh, have 392 participants. And the score in this, in this uh, test is not far from what has been reported, is around 25%. Most clinicians evaluate their own understanding of scientific evidence at around 55% of what they are reading. And what is very interesting and what I want to dedicate to, uh, what I want to dedicate to the very last minutes of my talk is not all statistical concepts are equally misunderstood. The percentage of correct answers per question and each question is evaluating a different statistical concept ranges from four to 79%. And admitting I don't know ranges from three to almost 50%. So what's going on here? Let me tell you and to go back and to go full circle with some of the ideas I was talking about in the last minutes. Some of these questions evaluated the same statistical concept. Let me tell you, let me, let me show you what I mean by this. If we ask textbook definition for positive predictive value, in other words, which number three, which test characteristic quantifies the probability that a person has a positive test result? Sorry, this is not positive predictive value, but it goes in the same ideas. Um, actually has the disease. Oh, sorry, this was actually positive predictive value. Yes, the, the probability of someone actually having the disease. If we ask it, as it comes in the textbook, 79% of participants, oh, 79% of participants answer it correctly. But if we answer for, if we ask, for example, a clinical case without prevalence, as what we, as what I uh, showed you with the breast cancer screening case, then almost none of them get it right. So it's not that clinicians don't know that knowing the prevalence is important for knowing if a patient has or not a disease. They know that. They know the textbook definition. But when it's outside the frame, they are used to think about in these concepts. When it's outside what they typically read, when there is this discrepancy between what they read and what they face in front of the patient, then almost all of them get it correctly, get, get it incorrectly, sorry. So it's, I, I, med, med students and clinicians are stereotypically uh, nerds, are stereotypically hardworking, hard studying people. They tend to be, of course, to be very smart. And it's not a problem on their 
capacity or capability of understanding these concepts. It's really a framing uh, problem what's causing this confusion or the confusion between these, between these concepts. And that's part of what we wanted to test. Right now, we are in the middle of a longer than what they carried out in the Charité. It's not three hours. We are in the middle of a 12 hour statistical course, which is focused on patient care. We are not teaching how to calculate by hand uh, students T or how to uh, program in R. That's totally out of the scope of this course. It's, it's just dedicated to how to avoid cognitive bias and confusion between basic statistical concepts that are very frequently encountered in healthcare. And we will test our participants after this course, of course, and we are hoping to, to see positive changes in, 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 their, in their scores and in how frequent they avoid framing, framing, uh, framing generated problems for understanding scientific evidence. Of course, this is only part of the solution. We standardize the way medical journals publish, uh, publish evidence. Uh, I didn't show that study, but of course it has been measured. Uh, the way we express results affects the way we perceive their benefits or we perceive the magnitude of their effects. It's very frequent to confuse relative risk with absolute risk uh, changes. And yes, in an ideal, we would, uh, well, we wouldn't need to force journals. Journals themselves would voluntarily standardize the way they publish results. We wouldn't have the discrepancy I told you about. However, I, uh, I have more faith in teaching med students and clinicians about how to avoid these, these confusion generators and these cognitive biases than on the medical publishing industry. So that's, what, that's why we are trying this, this short study and, and that's it. Uh, hopefully you'll give me the opportunity of telling you about the results we obtained in a few months. This is details and I will be happy to take your questions.